Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, we are weak but he is strong, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide, he will wash away my sin, let this little child come in, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. sing over me and I receive your mercy your faithfulness is clear to see and is constant every day in the morning sing over me and I receive your mercy your faithfulness is clear to see like a sunrise it's constant every day and every breath I breathe to believe you are creating something good And though this season doesn't tell my stories I know you move mountains for me And you're just that good So I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough Cause he's more than enough And he knows what I need He knows, he knows, he knows In the silence I choose to believe you're working in the waiting yes you are and though the future is in clear to see Lord trust you anyway oh and every breath stories. I know you move mountains for me. And you're just that good. So I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough. Cause he's more than enough. And he knows what I need. Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Why 
hard to move away God knows what I need He does, He does What to worry What to worry What to worry God knows what I need He does, He does What to worry
come to fight for me And I'm gonna see In the middle of this soul And louder and louder You gotta hear my praises roar And I'm from the ashes So hope will arise When death is defeated The key is alive I'll raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery And I'll raise a hallelujah And speak lost your hold of me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of this soul I believe in God, the Father Almighty. 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Kia ora Fano. my name's Mark, this is Violet, and we at Elam we love Fano, and we are excited for you to join our Fano. <laughs> Definitely. My name is Crystal, uh, and we want to make sure that you get connected to what we are doing here at Dunedin Elam. If you want to get connected to us, if you want to come to an in-person service or hear about anything we're doing, we want to encourage you to check out our website at www.elamdunedin.com. Now you can check out our <laughs> message from Pastor Adam. Kia ora koutou katoa. Hi, it's Adam Dodds here and uh, great to be with you in your home or wherever it is you are watching uh, this service, watching this message and uh, quite excited. We're starting a new series today, uh, which I'll introduce in a moment. But I remember um, hearing this story of someone uh, speaking to uh, his pastor and he said, you know what, I've been a Christian for 22 years. And then he said, but I'm not a 22-year-old Christian. I'm actually a one-year-old Christian who has repeated the same year 22 times. And that's quite a sobering thought. And the truth is this, that maturity is not time served as a Christian. Because eternal life is free, but maturity is expensive. And as Dallas Willard has said, grace is opposed to earning, but it's not opposed to effort. And what I love about the Holy Spirit's goal for your life and for my life, the Holy Spirit's goal for all of our lives is to present everyone to God the Father fully mature in Christ. Colossians 1 verse 28. And the Holy Spirit's goal for your life and for mine is to become fully mature like Jesus, to become like him. And I love Jesus's words in Luke 6 verse 40, where Jesus says the disciple is not above the teacher but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. And that's Jesus's desire for you and for me to be fully trained, to be like him. Jesus wants us to grow mature. He wants us to grow in Christ-likeness. Uh, just briefly, the Christ-like life glorifies God. The Christ-like life is the satisfied life. The Christ-like life is the most productive life. And the Christ-like life is the most blessed life. I don't have time to prove those right now, but they are true and they are glorious. And so you may think, okay, cool, that God wants me to become mature. I, I'm to become more like Jesus. My goal in life is to become more like Christ. That's awesome. How do I do that? Well, that is a great question. Another question might be, great, that's great theory, but what does that actually look like practically? What am I aiming for and how do I know I'm making progress toward that goal? Well, they are awesome questions. And so it's my privilege to introduce to you a document that's been in the pipeline, been working on it for over six months. And the document is called The Picture of a Disciple. And the idea with this document is it describes the four things. So this is a document I've created with my team and in consultation with others. Um, but this document describes the four things that every disciple of Jesus needs to be, needs to know, and needs to do. That is, it's about a key, um, it's about character, it's about convictions, and it's also about competency. So the four things that each disciple of Jesus needs to know, needs to be, and needs to do. And so uh, we've got the kind of overview of that document, which we'll be showing you right now. And then also uh, I've got a more detailed version that breaks down each of those things into a whole bunch more detail so we can really unpack what does this actually mean practically in each way. 
And then what's cool about the document is you can use it for yourself as like a self audit to kind of look at the 12 things and go, okay, how am I going? Uh, what are some areas that I can grow in? And then you can actually measure tangible progress over months or years. It would also be a great document to uh, to work on and study uh, together as a small group. And that also could take quite a long time. And I've produced a small group resource um, for small group leaders and it's on the Facebook page. You guys should already know that. So today I'm introducing not only the document, but I want to focus on being. What are those things that Jesus calls us to be? And there are four things that you can see in the document. Uh, one of them is living with nothing to hide. And I actually covered that one to some degree in our Matthew 15 series just a few weeks ago. So I'm going to set that one aside and we're going to look at the other three aspects of what Jesus calls us to be. That disciples of Jesus are called to be these three things. And so of those three things we're going to focus on today, we're looking at the first one, which means loving God. A disciple of Jesus loves God. Not rocket science, absolutely not. But let's break this down a little bit in a little bit more detail. What does that actually mean? A disciple of Jesus loves God. A disciple of Jesus is not obligated to God. A disciple of Jesus doesn't live indebted to God. A disciple of Jesus doesn't serve God out of guilt. And a disciple of Jesus certainly doesn't serve God in order to increase their standing with him. A disciple of Jesus serves God because they love him. They love him. And there's two aspects to this that I want to talk about. So I'll go the first one, then I'll go the second one. Alrighty. So the first one, my own experience of, of being satisfied by the love of God. Uh, I remember when I became a Christian, uh, my decision to become a Christian when I was 17, it was in January 1997. It was a, it was a very deliberate decision. It, it wasn't particularly an emotional decision. Um, it was actually very calculated and, and my thought processes went something like this. I reflected on my long life, I was 17, uh, reflected on my life and looked at those different times in my lives where I felt the most satisfied, the most complete, the most whole, the most content. And what I observed was each of those times were times where either God drew near to me or I drew near to him. A number of those times were times when I was at the church that I was a part of in London uh, some of those times were when I was with uh, someone else, a friend of mine at her church uh, in Scotland. Another time uh, well, I was at a Christian conference, a little bit like Parachute, but not quite the same uh, Parachute Festival. And, and there were some other moments as well. And, and all of them had this common denominator of either God drawing near to me or me drawing near to him. And the outcome of that was was contentment, was satisfaction, was joy, was completeness. I, I, I felt in that in those moments I lacked nothing. And, and I, I realized later the words of Augustine were true of me as well. Augustine, the great African bishop from the fifth century, where he said, God, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And my heart found its rest in God. He, he so drew near to me. He so satisfied me that I couldn't but give myself to him. And it's the best decision I've ever made. And the rest of my life in many ways is just footnotes to that original decision back in 1997, 23 years ago. The truth is we don't generate a love for God. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. And so, uh, you know, where does a disciple of Jesus begin their journey of loving God? But where they begin is first being satisfied by his love. You know, we don't generate this love for him. Our love for him is simply a response to experiencing his overwhelming love for us. Have you experienced his overwhelming love for you? What is your experience of being satisfied by the love of God? What is your experience of God drawing near to you? When you've experienced it like I have and, and no doubt you have, then your prayer becomes very similar to the prayer in Psalm 27 verse 4, this famous prayer, this beautiful prayer. And maybe you pray this too. And if not, I invite you to do so. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. It's just beautiful, eh? What are some things that you enjoy doing in your spare time? When you've got spare time, time up your sleeve, what are the things that you enjoy doing? What things are fun for you? You know, maybe it's reading a book or maybe it's speaking to friends or maybe it's going for a walk or going for a cycle ride or going for a run or watching YouTube videos or something on Netflix or searching for a good recipe or experimenting in the kitchen or doing some gardening or whatever it might be. 
good stuff. Well, can I submit to you that disciples of Jesus in their downtime, some of the time, will also choose to spend time with God. Not because we have to, but because we love him, because we want to. Will we spend time with him out of a delight, not any sense of um, duty or self-discipline, but it comes out of a delight for him. Amen. So let me continue with Psalm 27. So that's verse four. Let me continue now. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. And so why do disciples of Jesus seek God? Why do disciples of Jesus spend time with God and, 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 and love God? You know, why do we serve God? Why do we draw near to God? Well, you could say, according to the first part of verse five, that I will seek God because he keeps me safe. He protects me. There's truth to that, but it's a little bit using of God, I would suspect. The latter part of verse five, you could say, I seek God because he gives me an immovable foundation for my life. And that's true, but I think there's more to it. You could say, according to the first part of verse six, I seek God because he gives me victory and he makes me successful. Or according to the latter part of verse six, you could say, I seek God because he makes me happy. And, and there's truth to all those things, but I don't think that's the primary reason we seek God. I think the primary reason we seek God is because we want to, because we delight in him. Verse four, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing upon his beauty. There's a delight, there's a joy, there's a wanting to. And that leads to the other things too. It does lead to victory. It does lead to protection. It does lead to having an immovable foundation for my life. At least all those other things. And that's great. That's not why we do it. I love verse eight where it says, my heart says if you seek his face, it's like the heart is speaking to the will, the volitional part of us. And then the will replies, you know, I hear you heart, you want to see God? Let's go. And it's just awesome. It's like, yes, let's do it. So I think disciples of Jesus love God out of delight, not self-discipline. Delight can lead to self-discipline. I know that because I love God so much and he is so amazing, that leads me to discipline myself to live in a certain way. And so sometimes I do things when I don't feel like it. That's true, but it comes out of a place of delight. Delight should lead to self-discipline, yes, but delight can never be replaced by self-discipline. Biblical faith is primarily about delight, not duty or obligation. It's about delight. It's about joy. It's about love. One of my friends, uh, amazing woman of God, used to be a professor here at the University of Otago teaching Old Testament. And what she would do with her students um, right at the start of a course is she would give them all a little bit of honey to eat and to taste on their lips. And then she would explain that the purpose of studying the Bible, not just the Old Testament, the whole Bible, the purpose of it wasn't just to gain more head knowledge. That's great. Knowledge is good. But it was actually to, to, to love this thing called the scriptures, love this thing called the Bible. And then she'd read from Psalm 119. And I'm going to share some verses from that for you now. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Yes. So disciples of Jesus love God. How? By delighting in him. So then the only question becomes is, how do you connect with God? How do you connect with Jesus? The only questions then become practical. How do we best do this? And so can I put it to you? And this is a, something every disciple of Jesus has got to figure out. Figure out how you best connect with Jesus and do that. I'll say that again. Figure out how you best connect with Jesus and do that. Well, what do you do? Well, it must involve some engagement with the Bible, and I'll come back to why later. 
But other than that, it might involve praying with others primarily or primarily praying alone. It might involve primarily praying your own words or praying written words or praying in tongues or some combination of those. For those who don't know what tongues is, it's a prayer language that God gives to some disciples of Jesus. Um, it might involve primarily singing or primarily silence. It might involve your eyes closed as you focus on God, or it might involve times of prayer where your eyes are open and you're taking in the beauty of God's creation. It might involve biblical meditation where you're just taking one or two verses from the Bible and really chewing over on those and thinking deeply about what those words mean. Or maybe you read multiple chapters a day, a bit like if you're going to read through the Bible in a year. The point is, is whatever you do, or maybe you read a devotional or a study guide or a commentary, which I do some of the time. The point is, whatever of those things you do, connect with Jesus. If that helps you connect with him, do that. And if it doesn't, don't. But whatever you do, connect with Jesus. I love uh, Pete Scazzaro, the pastor. I love his comment. Your greatest gift to the world is you communing with Jesus. Your greatest gift to the world is you communing with Jesus. Why? Because when you commune with Jesus, when you love on him, when you delight in him, he infuses you with his life, with his truth, with his joy, with his love, with his goodness. His, something of who he is enters inside of you. I think the Bible talks about that in terms of being filled with the spirit. So then as you go around life and as you talk to people and you engage with people and, 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 and you do actions and you speak words and you listen and you're physically you're present and all the things that you do. It's not just you anymore. You have the life of God present in you in a greater way because you commune with Jesus. Wow, he's absolutely right. Your greatest gift to the world is you communing with Jesus. The flip side of that is what Jesus says in John 15. Apart from me, you can do nothing of eternal significance, of eternal consequence. Absolutely true. So how often do you connect with Jesus? If you connect with Jesus regularly, awesome. Can I encourage you? Why don't you share how you do that with some folks that you do life with, with some folks around you, maybe in your small group or something else? And if you don't connect with Jesus regularly, then let me encourage you with this. What's one thing you could do to change that so you do start connecting with Jesus? What's one practical thing you can do to change that so you can start connecting with Jesus regularly? Because the greatest thing you can do for the world is you connecting with Jesus, you communing with him. In the seventh century, there was a famous Irish uh, disciple of Jesus called Aidan, and he became a missionary to the north of England, where he evangelized the north of England at the request. He came at the request of the king of that part of Northumbria in the north of England. And Aidan was walking down the road one day, and one person who met Aidan describes the encounter this way. He said this, this is from the 7th century, I am English, I used to be pagan. When I saw Aidan coming down the road, I thought, here comes that foreigner the king thinks so highly of with his strange religion, but I don't want any newfangled ways, the old gods are good enough for me. But Aidan stopped when he got to me and he said, are you a Christian? No, I said, and I don't want to be either. Then he said, will you tell me what you believe? And get this. And for some reason, I wanted to talk to him. That's what he said. And for some reason, I wanted to talk to him. And we talked. All that he said was new to me about Jesus and how he came to show us what God is like. And then he said, would you like to hear more? Would you go to a meeting in your village if I arranged one? And I said, yes. So I went, and what I heard convinced me. Aidan's monks convinced me too by the sort of people they were. They didn't ask for anything. They just wanted me to know the truth. And now I am a Christian. I love what he says. For some reason, I wanted to talk to him. There was something Christ-like about Aidan's life that just drew me to him. And then there was something about the other, his brothers, the, these other monks, and how they lived for Jesus too, that was just attractive. They were Christ-like in their being. Imagine being so thoroughly Christ-like in your being that as you encounter people in normal life, something of Christ in you just impresses them and they're like, I want to know more. Well, do you know, that's actually God's plan for your life, to become that Christ-like. It is. You know, it's one of the most common questions. What is God's plan for my life? Well, here's the answer. 
His plan for your life is to become like Jesus. It's the highest calling and it's awesome. What a privilege. The poem, The Portrait of a Christian by Beatrice Cleland puts it this way. Not only in the words you say, not only in the deeds confessed, but in the most unconscious way is Christ expressed. For me, it was not the truth you taught, to you so clear, to me so dim. But when you came to me, you brought a sense of him. And from your eyes, he beckons me. And from your lips, his love is shed. Till I lose sight of you and see the Christ instead. That is God's desire for you and for me. And what a privilege. So that's one aspect of becoming like Jesus, of loving God means becoming like Jesus, delighting in God. Let me go on to the second aspect that I want to look at for our time today. Let me ask this question. What is the distinguishing mark of being a Christian? What is the distinguishing mark of being a Christian? And I think some of the most common answers would be faith, a belief in Jesus and his resurrection. And if that's the case, I want to say, okay, but how can you tell that that's the case in someone's life? Someone might say the distinguishing mark is faith in the sense of trusting Jesus with their life. And again, I want to say, okay, but how can you tell that that's the case in somebody's life? Someone else might say love, that love for God and love for people is the distinguishing mark of a Christian. And again, I want to say, okay, and I agree with that too, but how can you tell practically um, that that is true in someone's life? Well, let's look at the first account of where, the, where Jesus called his disciples and where he called his disciples. Look at what Jesus calls them to. And I think that's a clue as to what the distinguishing mark is of being a follower of Jesus, of being a disciple, of being a Christian. So here we are, Mark chapter 1 from verse 16 through to verse 20. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus called Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Looking at that passage, two questions. First one, what did Jesus call them to? Second question, what distinguishes Jesus' disciples as his disciples? What sets them apart? I think the answer is really clear. What he calls them to is this, to follow him. And what sets them apart is this, that they actually do. They follow him. A few months ago, our pastoral staff and our elders went through a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism by Professor Robert Coleman, written about 50 years ago. And it's a book, it's freely available online, and it's primarily about how Jesus made disciples, which is why it's relevant for us. Um, and, and chapter three in particular, I'm going to draw from right now because he has some really helpful things to say about what it means for a disciple to love God. So Robert Coleman begins chapter three by saying this. Jesus expected the people he was with to obey him. They were not required to be smart. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but they had to be loyal. This became the distinguishing mark by which they were known. Loyalty expressed in doing what Jesus said. And then Coleman continues, the simplicity of this approach is marvelous, if not astounding. None of the disciples at first were asked to make a statement of faith or accept a well-defined creed system of beliefs, although they doubtless recognized Jesus to be the Messiah. For the moment, all they were asked to do was follow Jesus. So according to Robert Coleman, the distinguishing mark of a Christian is someone who follows Jesus, someone who so commits to him in their loyalty that they obey him, that they follow him with their lives. Implicit in that is belief in terms of believing things about him that are true, faith in terms of trusting him, and also love for God and people because that's what Jesus taught. So all those things are central ingredients and need to be present, yes, to all of those, but the distinguishing mark, it appears from Mark chapter one and elsewhere, is they actually followed him. Now, imagine a famous artist 
or a famous musician or a famous master chef or a famous sports coach. So first of all, think of yourself. You know, maybe you're an aspiring artist or an aspiring chef or a sports person. You choose the sport uh, or sport of your choosing or, you know, or an artist or something like that. And then this world famous person in your field gets in touch with you and asks if if would you like them to be your coach, to be your mentor, to coach you in the thing you so love to do? What an incredible privilege that would be. How amazing would that be? And then imagine that they coach you for six months or so and you meet every week for about six months or so. And this is going on for quite some time. And this is an area of passion. You love to cook or you love to paint or you love to play rugby or whatever it is. Then after six months, you could reflect and ask the question, am I their follower? Are they my coach? And, and let me just submit this to you. It doesn't matter how much you love your coach and it doesn't actually matter how much you believe in your coach. If you're not actually following their instruction, then you're not really honoring them. And they, they're your coach, but only in name, not in reality. The coaching is effectively useless to you because you're not putting into practice the things that they're saying and it won't change you at all. And then what makes things worse is to claim to be their follower might mean that you kind of almost tarnish their reputation and then give them a bad name because you're not doing the things that they said to do. And that's kind of full on and that's true. But it's the it's this thing about to claim to be a follower of Jesus, but not actually follow him is a contradiction in terms. Flip side, let's go to the positive because it's far more exciting. Uh, Robert Coleman says this, just as Jesus found his blessedness in doing the Father's will, and then that's why we have to read the Bible regularly for ourselves, otherwise we don't know what God's will is. So just as Jesus found his blessedness from doing the Father's will, so as followers of Jesus, we will find the same, that we experience blessing as we do the Father's will as well. This is the sole duty of a servant. It was true of Christ, and nothing less can ever be accepted as worthy of his disciple. I love the blessedness that he talks about, and you know, many of you watching will already be followers of Jesus. For you, what is your experience of him blessing your life? For me, man, I've experienced his blessing in countless ways. One is provision. I've experienced his provision over and over and over again. Another one is an inner joy and contentment that never really leaves. It's now my possession. It's now part of who I am. It's a gift of God. It's part of the blessing of being his follower. Another part of the blessing of being a follower of Jesus, a disciple, is that reassurance and confidence that Jesus is my guide for life. And though I don't know the next step and though I don't necessarily know what's around the corner, I can trust him and he's my guide and he will lead me. And another sense of the blessedness of being a follower of Jesus is the authority we have in Christ so that when we come up against situations which are not good, we don't just kind of shrink back and go, oh, well, that's such a shame. But we can actually take authority in Christ partner by faith with him and see change happen and see breakthrough happen in that context. Man, there's such a blessedness to being a follower of Jesus, to putting what he says into practice. And then Robert Coleman says this, and he doesn't pull any punches, but I think it's helpful. He says, unless there is this dedication to all that we know Jesus wants us to do now, However immature our understanding may be, in other words, we may not know much, and that's totally fine, but we've got to be committed to the things that we do know about. It is doubtful if we will ever progress further in his life and mission. There is no place in the kingdom for a slacker. And I think he is right. A slacker is someone who's lazy, who can't really be bothered. And, you know, and I know sometimes in Christian circles, I've heard people talk about grace. There's grace. It's fine. And, and that can almost be like a slippery term that is used to excuse not just laziness, but sloppiness and actually not honoring God and giving him his due. But grace also teaches us to say no to laziness and other things that displease and dishonor the Lord. So back to Mark chapter one, we've got these two sets of brothers, James and John, Simon and Andrew, and they may well have wanted to continue fishing and follow Jesus from a distance. But that would be to not follow him at all because you cannot follow Jesus and not go where he is going. There would have been times when their wills, what they wanted, would have clashed with the will of Jesus, what Jesus wanted. 
And it's those moments that reveal whether or not they indeed were his followers. It's okay having a, a tug of war about it, but where do you actually finally land at the end of the day? And the truth is you can't claim to be a follower of Jesus and not actually follow him. It's a contradiction in terms. But this idea of the test or the clash of wills, let me put this to you, that we all have this test in our lives. And it's so common right throughout the Bible. Think of Abraham. You know, God called him to leave his homeland and go to a land that God would show him. Well, maybe he didn't want to go. Maybe he liked his homeland. Maybe his preferences were to stay put and to be comfortable. But God called him to go. What will Abraham do? Or Moses. God called Moses to stand before Pharaoh and to be God's mouthpiece, uh, an instrument in, in rescuing God's people from slavery in Egypt. But Moses didn't want to. He said, I don't, I'm scared of Pharaoh and I'm not good at speaking. And I, I and he had all these reasons why, God, this is a bad choice. So you've got a clash of wills. God says one thing. Moses is like, I'm not very keen on this one, God. Gideon was the same. You know, God's people, Israel, were oppressed by the people of Midian. And God called Gideon and raised him up in order to deliver God's people from the Midianites. But Gideon didn't want to. And so this clash of wills is very, very common right throughout the Bible. And then uh, a different sense, there's also a clash of wills when you think of the Apostle Paul. He longed to minister in Western and Northwestern Turkey, modern day Turkey. And, and his intent was to go there. And God said, no. No. What do you do? There's a clash of wills. And I know I've had time when I, times when I've wanted to do things, but I believe God was saying no. And later, some of the time I figured out why God was saying no. Some of the time I didn't. And so when you have that clash of wills, what are you going to do? It's the test. So Simon, one of the uh, fishermen in the passage, he had this experience too, where Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. And then he came to Peter, because Simon was renamed Peter, and said, Peter, I want to wash your feet as well. And Peter's like, no, nah, you're not going to wash my feet. <laughs> and then Jesus says, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but you someday you will. And Peter's like, no, nah, I know we're negotiating, but the answer's still no. It's not right. You're the Lord. You're the Messiah. You're my rabbi. You're my master. You're my teacher. I'm your servant. I'm your disciple. I should be washing your feet, not the other way around. Jesus, the answer is no. Jesus then replies, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. When Peter hears that, when, when the conversation kind of escalates to that point, Peter's like, okay, you know what? Not only my feet, you can wash my knees, my elbows, my fingers. Man, you wash anything you like, I am in. Why? Because his heart belonged to Jesus. Yes, there was a clash of wills. And yes, Peter didn't understand. But when he realized that, no, Jesus is serious about this, then what does he do? He says, yes, Lord. And he follows him. Is that your experience when you've had a clash of wills where you feel the Lord says one thing and you want to do something else? What do you do? Followers of Jesus follow. They follow him. They do what he says. And sometimes they understand and sometimes they don't. And sometimes understanding comes later and sometimes it doesn't. But that's part of what it means to follow our master. Robert Coleman says absolute obedience to the will of God, of course, was the controlling principle of Jesus's life. In his human nature, Jesus continually gave consent to the will of his father, which made it possible for God to use his life fully according to its intended purpose. And I love that, that as we follow Jesus, as we continue to give consent to God to do what he wants in our lives, God will use us fully according to the purpose for which he created us. How exciting is that? And that was Peter's experience. I, I shared an example of a time in his life where there was a clash of wills and he said yes to the Lord. Man, was he used powerfully by God. This one time, uh, Peter was walking down the street and his shadow was, was there because of the sun you know, on one side and the shadow down the other. And people were healed just because his shadow touched them. That's crazy, but that's awesome. Why? He was so full of Jesus. His being was so Christ-like that something about him and the anointing of God in his life meant that his shadow healed people. That is not only nuts, but I love it and I want more for me and for everyone I know. You know, the reason that if you're watching this today and you're not of Jewish heritage, the reason that you're part of the church or uh, invited to become part of the church, it's because of Peter. 
Originally, it was just Jewish people who were followers of Jesus. And the reason that non-Jews could come in as equals was because of Peter and what God did through Peter. Check out Acts 10 and 11. Man, talk about being fully used by God. And we can only be fully used by him as we keep following him and saying yes to Jesus. So disciples of Jesus, we delight. We love God by delighting in him and by following him. Delighting, following. Delighting, following. These are two ingredients of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple. I'm going to conclude with a prayer now. And if you're watching this and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but you want to be, I want you to join in this prayer with me. And if you're watching this right now and you are a follower of Jesus, but you realize, you know what, I need to commit my life. I need to recommit myself back to the Lord and actually take this seriously and say, God, I want to honor you properly not just according to my own desires, but Lord, I want to please you. I want my life to be a fragrant offering to you. Then I'd love you to join in too. So I'm going to pray this one prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. It's called the Methodist Covenant Prayer. And it dates back probably to the time of John Wesley, one of my great heroes. And so wherever you are, I'd love it if you could just agree in your heart as I pray this prayer right now. Here it is. Lord, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to do what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.
knows my name before I call. You tell the storm when it will cease before it starts. The God above who searches deep in my heart The highest praise cannot proclaim how great you are There is none like you None like you The faith
Elam, we believe that you can give without loving, but you cannot truly love without giving. And so we want to give you an opportunity to give. If you are struggling financially at the moment, please do not feel that you have to give. Definitely adjust your giving proportionately. Uh, but now is the time to give if that is something that you want to partake in. You can do that on our website at www.elimdunedin.com. So it appears we've come to the end of our service. Uh, and so we are thankful that you have joined us this week. Make sure you get connected. Yeah. And uh, all we're responsible for is the next thing that God is talking to you about. So what has God been talking to you about during the service? Uh, could it be uh, getting to know Him more, uh, through uh, connecting through small groups, uh, from reading the Bible more, uh, to actually putting your decision to, to trust in God for the first time? Uh, if so, just... I would love to talk to you about it and, and answer any questions you might have so you can comment below or, or get in touch with us. You never have to do this journey alone and so we want to make sure that you have people to do your journey with. Uh, so definitely get in touch with us. Right now we want to send you off with a little bit of a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.